Um, we'll just be starting in a minute or so, just give more people a chance to uh, arrive. Right. I think we should. Uh, I think we should begin. Um, I'm uh, I'm Tom Fisher from Privacy International, and I'm very pleased to be chairing this uh, this this webinar on the World Bank Digital ID and Social Protection, organised by India Centre for Internet and Society. Um, in conjunction with uh, Privacy International and the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at the New York University School of Law. Um, I should state before we start that we will be recording this session. Um, and it's really an exciting, uh, exciting uh, webinar that I've been looking forward to now for some time. Um, because you know the issues surrounding digital ID, social protection are hugely important around the world. Issues of exclusion, discrimination, exploitation, and surveillance um, that come into play, amongst others. Um, and it's a particularly exciting time to be exploring these topics in civil society uh, because there's so much fantastic work coming out from there that we'll be hearing a bit of from today, uh, particularly surrounding the role of institutions like the World Bank. Um, there was recently an open letter from civil society um, with more than 70 signatories aimed at um, the World Bank's id for d initiative, um, questioning how their approach to digital ID um, dealt with issues like human rights, as well as looking at factors like the evidence base that the World Bank is using in its decisions. So there's really that interest coming up from, uh, from civil society organizations around the world. Um, and I say very much kind of a, a bottom up um, work, which when I'm talking with different organizations around the world, that interest in this topic is huge. Um, and I think the World Bank and the role of the World Bank is a crucial one, um, which is why it's been the focus of the work of our three organizations. Um, you know, of course, it's far from only the far from the only funder for these types of projects, and it's far from the only voice in the discourse surrounding themes like digital ID, but it has a crucial role. And that's not only in the billions of dollars of funding it provides, um, also serves as a key um, thought leader, you might say, in this space, providing guidance, technical expertise, um, and is also extremely influential on other international organizations. Um, so I'd say that this is an organization that has its own policy position. Uh, it's not a neutral organization. Um, and because of that, it deserves to be critiqued, to have its things explored for good or for ill, what it is, what it is doing its position on these topics. Um, yeah, as I say, the World Bank is only one part of the global picture of these systems, but it is a crucial one. Um, and I'd like to first talk turn to uh, Caitlin Trophy from CHRGJ at NY, News, uh, NY Law School, um, who recently published an excellent report on the role of the id for d initiative at the World Bank. Um, I'll just say, if you have questions, we'll have some time at the end, so please put anything in the chat um, and we will, um, we will have a bit of time at the end for some questions. Um, but Caitlin, if you'd like to um, tell us a bit about your work and some of the background here. Great, thanks so much, Tom, for that excellent introduction. And I'm so happy to be here today with this fantastic panel and to be co-hosting this event with CIS and Privacy International. Um, I will just share my screen before starting my presentation. And hopefully you can all see the beginning of this presentation. Um, and if you can't, please, uh, one of the panelists, do give me a shout. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, our three organizations have come together today to discuss three major pieces of research 
that we've independently released in the last year. And while these three pieces of research have all taken slightly different methodological approaches and focused on different issues, different case studies, different regions, I think it's pretty clear from reading all three pieces that there's significant overlap in some of the trends and concerns that have been identified around digital ID, digital government, and the role of institutions like the World Bank. So this past June, our project published what we've called a research primer on the World Bank and its identification for development-led initiatives. Um, and we've called this a primer because while it does attempt to give a, a broad overview of current information, and it does introduce some novel arguments and analysis, it doesn't really try to reach definitive conclusions about specific systems or approaches, but instead it opens and ends by identifying key questions. And these are questions for the human rights movement, for academics and scholars, and also for the World Bank itself as it develops new policy. And before I really get into the substance of a report, I wanted to first share a bit about why we engaged in this research in the first place because the entry point for our project into the field of digital ID stemmed from our work on social welfare systems, social protection, and access to social and economic rights for poor and marginalized groups. And in looking across different government approaches to poverty alleviation and social inclusion, we observe that different forms of digitalized identification systems, often including biometrics, were increasingly being used to administer things like cash transfer programs, social pensions, and other forms of income support targeted at the poor. But as usage of these digitalized technologies increased in the social welfare space, we saw a growing body of evidence that suggested such systems actually posed a very high risk of furthering social inclusion for some of the most marginalized groups, leading to a whole host of human rights concerns, including discrimination and a heightened risk of surveillance. For instance, I know my fellow panelists will no doubt talk a bit about experiences in India with the Aadhaar system, where the unique identification system had led to quite egregious cases of individuals being cut off from things like food rations, fuel subsidies, and other forms of social welfare. But it's not only social welfare systems where we began to see some of these effects, because as the ambition of identification systems grows, so too does its impact. So on the right-hand side of this slide, there's a very simple schematic from our report, which just aims to show the multiplicity of rights and areas of life that may be affected both positively and negatively by the introduction of digital ID systems and digital government. Yet in opposition to this growing body of evidence that such systems, such systems can generate significant risk of harm, there is also what we perceive to be a much stronger counter-narrative um, that heralded such systems as a, a necessary component of the sustainable development agenda. And when you read some of the articulations of this narrative, it's often traced back to Sustainable Development Goal 16.9, which calls on states to provide legal identity for all, including birth registration by 2030. Um, and there's now a very rich body of literature about what we mean by um, legal identity and its ties to specific human rights. But I and I cannot hope to do justice to that here today, but I think for our purposes, one of the most important factors has been that digital technologies have come to be seen as a core solution to addressing this you know, rather large challenge for sustainable development. And one of the strongest voices advocating for digital ID as such a solution has been the World Bank. Um, it's been you know, portrayed as a means of providing proof of identity for the so-called invisible billion of people who do not currently have that proof, um, which are numbers generated by the World Bank itself. Um, and it's been the, the foundation of the Identification for Development Initiative, which is now a core team that's been established at the bank. And to give you a sense of their impact in their 2021 annual report, they state that, quote, ID4D is currently helping 49 countries to implement ID and civil registration ecosystems. This includes shaping $1.5 billion in financing in 35 countries, with potential to support better IDs and civil registration documentation for up to 470 million people, end quote. So this is a, a considerable initiative that does appear to be having significant influence in many countries around the world. So the genesis of our research project was really to understand why digital ID had become such a fixture of the, the development agenda, including what the evidence base was for some of the claims that had been linked to these systems, 
to better understand how this consensus opinion had been embedded in the work of many different teams, both inside and outside of the World Bank, and also to identify who were some of the key actors in shaping this agenda. So the methodology that we adopted for our report was to look at publicly available documents, including World Bank financing agreements and project documentation, ID for D reports and public statements. We also engaged directly with staff at the World Bank's ID for D team who reviewed an earlier version of the report and had the opportunity to provide corrections and clarifications would have been published in full as an annex to our report. We also engaged in a series of interviews and consultations with representatives from philanthropic donors, international organizations, civil society organizations, and academic experts working on related fields. So this primer is very much the culmination of a collaborative effort and represents, we hope, a set of shared concerns. So in the past, there have been a number of different critiques that have been loved at the World Bank for its various areas of policy making, you know, for instance, in the way that it encourages countries to take on additional debt, on certain conditionalities attached to World Bank financing, on controversial policy areas like financialization, and also on an overall lack of attention and focus on human rights. Uh, there's also increasingly critique of the World Bank's role that it plays as a knowledge, lead, a knowledge bank or thought leader with questions raised about the rigor and impartiality of its numerous research projects, including the now defunct business report. So through our analysis and research, we would argue that many of these same critiques might be leveled at the work being done around digital ID. And to be clear, when we talk about digital ID at the World Bank, we're talking first of all about a specific initiative, which is founded through what's called a multi-donor trust fund, which means that it gets financial contributions from a variety of national governments and philanthropic donors. Um, and this is the initiative that produces many of the publicly facing products that are addressing digital ID and its concerns but coming from the World Bank. We're also talking about a much broader policy agenda that cuts across the bank's different areas of work. And in this way, we can start to deconstruct the bank's influence into three different buckets. And the first is, what I'm calling here ideas or the knowledge bank. And it's the way that the bank is able to shape policy preferences and development consensus around what constitutes good governance around the world. The second is financing. And I'm calling this financing plus because it not only involves money and financial products, but also the direct technical assistance that's given to government. And third is global convening. And this is how the bank leverages its networks to you know, facilitate greater discussion of policy issues and to shape some of the discussions that are happening in key fora around the world. And our report goes into some depth on each of these different areas of influences, and I won't be able to cover them all today, but I wanted to share two of our main findings from the report. And the first is around the manufacturing of a new consensus around digital ID and its role in development. And the second is about how country engagements are being shaped by this consensus, being building systems which we believe may ultimately heighten the risk of human rights harms. So what have these two areas shown us through our report? Um, in talking about manufacturing consensus, we're drawing on the work of scholars like Rita Kakira, who applied this concept to the growing elite consensus around the Adar system in India. And I think that will be a major through line in today's uh, discussion, the influence that that particular system has had on digital ID around the world. And we're arguing that the World Bank has played a similar role on the global stage. And this slide shows you kind of some of the elements of what we see as this new consensus. And I'll just briefly touch on a few of them. The first is that the, the bank has brought together a diverse range of varied agendas around identification and developed a consolidated view that many of the positive aspects that have been attached to digital ID can be established through centralized or concentrated systems. So it's really bringing together a diverse range of actors and interests and trying to bridge the gaps between them and develop a consolidated view of a system that can accomplish many different tasks at once. And the centerpiece of this view is what the bank will often call foundational systems in which we argue in our report are really more transactional or economic identity systems. And to be clear, the, the identity that these systems are providing is 
quite far removed from the form of identity envisaged under SDG 16.9, because this is no longer about legal or official identity, but instead it's about ensuring uniqueness and facilitating interactions and transactions remotely often between different parties. And while it can be linked to rights, it often is not linked to rights. And the mere possession of this new form of identity doesn't guarantee any sort of recognition of name or nationality. It doesn't guarantee any sort of access to social and economic rights. So while references to SDG 16.9 continue to appear in many of the bank's publications, the actual policy recommendations have become quite far removed from the original intention of that goal. Another key aspect of this consensus is a strong presumption about the benefits that digital ID can bring, despite the fact that there is a distinct lack of an evidence base that really proves that these benefits can be realized through the types of systems that are being implemented today. Um, there have been you know, a number of controversies about certain savings figures that have been offered by the bank. For instance, the ADHAR savings figure that was offered in the World Development Report of 2016. And there have been some efforts to introduce new impact assessments, but our overall conclusion looking across the range of evidence is that there's still a distinct gap that proves the benefits of these systems. And this is in contrast to growing recognition of the harms that they can create. And finally, because I know I've run quite long on time here, I wanna to touch on the last bullet point, which is this idea of manageable human rights risks. Because I think it's important to acknowledge that the bank itself is always cognizant of the fact that digital ID systems bring risks. It's something that's acknowledged in all of their policy documents and their publications. But these are often portrayed as both acceptable and manageable rather than a sort of existential threat to the role that digital ID systems can play in society. And it's less acknowledged that many of these risks are created by things like deep structural inequalities, legal frameworks that sit outside the scope of digital ID systems, and political, economic, and social dynamics that will be near impossible to overcome within the confines of one digital program being introduced by a national government. So to close my remarks, I just want to emphasize that, you know, this is an extensive report of over 100 pages, and none of the developments that we've identified within this report should be seen as inevitable. So the questions that we hope that our research can help to open up are ones of course correction. How do we get off of what we see as a potentially harmful path? How can the ideas, money, and networks that an institution like the bank can command be turned towards more human rights-centric practices and policies? And perhaps most importantly, what role can better research and more focused advocacy play in facilitating this course correction? So I hope that ends it on a, a somewhat constructive note. I look forward to, to continuing this discussion with the rest of the panelists and I'll, I'll give it back to Tom to take us forward. All right, well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Caitlin. That was um, fascinating work, as I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and I'd urge you all to also to take a look at um, their full reports. Um, yeah. So now we're turning to Shruti Trikhanad from India's Center for Internet and Society. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them down in the chat. Um, so um, Shruti, please do uh, talk about your work. Thanks, Tom. Um, let me just share my screen. Yeah, I hope everyone can see that. Yeah, before I, uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible. Uh, but before starting, I just wanna kind of contextualize why we looked at this report, or why we looked at this work in this report. Uh, with the Special Rapporteur's uh, report on extreme poverty and human rights in 2019, uh, the report kind of warned of the creation of these new digital welfare states, which are basically systems of social protection that are being driven by digital data and technology with the ostensible goal of effective governance. But usually the focus on these systems is on eliminating fraud and minimizing leakages in the system. And initially, essentially to kind of reduce costs associated with social protection. Um, as a result, they tend to have higher demands on citizens. So citizens often have to go through more hurdles or obstacles to be able to prove that they are eligible for certain entitlements. And it results in a complete reversal of the traditional notion that the state is accountable to its citizens. So I think with this, um, I also want to add the caveat of, I think Caitlin already mentioned this, but 
where it's almost unquestionable that legal identity and accessible legal identity is necessary in developing states um, and a mission to kind of provide systems of identity by the World Bank and other actors is certainly good. I think the only questions we are raising here is the form that these identity systems are taking. And in our opinion, the resemblance they are taking to this digital welfare state model. Um, just gonna briefly touch on our research methodology in um, the report. We essentially focused largely on case studies in Nigeria and Kenya, uh, because these are developing their digital ID systems currently, and there is a pretty heavy influence that we've observed from the World Bank. There are a lot of projects that the World Bank are financing and providing technical and policy assistance for in these countries. So we were able to get almost all our information from the World Bank website. So their research report, their country diagnostic reports, the project reports, so those include um, project appraisals, the implementation and the agreements themselves with their countries. And for any kind of lacking uh, information, we were able to conduct informal interviews with local researchers in Nigeria and Kenya and other people working in the digital space. Uh, and we found mainly two key trends, I would say. The first is that the World Bank relied very heavily on the quote unquote success of the Aadhaar program in being able to solve developmental problems in India. And a lot of the models that they have recommended in these other countries, we believe resembles the Aadhaar model in that they are usually centralized, they're connected to all, uh, they're used as a platform for a variety of services and they include biometric enrollment and authentication. And the second is that even through a variety of the World Bank social protection programs, they include or they focused on a digitalization of this social protection such that it is now mediated by technology it has essentially biometric authentication, enrollment, and eligibility, and tends to focus overall on addressing fraud in the existing, in the welfare system, which again, we believe is, a, is also largely inspired by Aadhaar, which was also the goal, which was always the goal of Aadhaar to kind of minimize frauds and weed out ghost beneficiaries within the welfare system. So in, uh, I mean, there's a lot to go through uh, here, but I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go over our very key takeaways. In Kenya, there were a series of World Bank projects, uh, including the National Safety Net Program and the Inclusive Growth and Fiscal Management Development Program, where they assisted the government of Kenya in, or they supported the government of Kenya in implementing their existing social protection schemes. Um, and in through these documents, there was one kind of key takeaway that the World Bank uh, identified, in which is that the current social protection schemes, they believe, was limited in its ability to verify and target beneficiaries, and therefore, again, limited in its ability to minimize leakages. So once again, they recommended a kind of digitization of these to be able to support the government's agenda, which included, amongst others, three uh, key factors. First, that there would be one single registry across all um, the social protection schemes, which would be, which would link would be also be linked to their uh, civil registry and verification system. Second, that it would have some sort of uh, biometric verification. And last, that they would onboard uh, payment service providers so that they'd be able to make payments electronically. So we see, saw this across a range of their social protection programs with the government of Kenya. Um, and yeah, so they did, I think Caitlin mentioned this as well, they did time and again identify the kind of harm in making digital ID mandatory to access welfare. And they recommended that the government not do that. However, and this is a trend we've, we've noticed throughout the report, this is not, was not reliably followed by the government. It was almost immediately made mandatory in 2019 and continues to be made mandatory for a series of important users, which kind of just reinforces that it is it becomes difficult to minimize the risks introduced by a digital welfare model once it has been introduced. Um, similarly, in Nigeria, uh, what we observed here was that the model that the World Bank was recommending for the digital ID system very closely resembled the one that we see in Aadhaar. Um, and we can see this through their Africa business plan report, which also was also reflected in a series of documents with Nigeria itself which is that they believe that, a, that the Nigerian system currently was limited in its, um, had limited coverage and accessibility in its existing CRBS. It had a very fragmented management, so it did not have one central authority that was 
taking care of all these identity systems. There was insufficient use of technology and that there existed a, a lot of functional and foundational IDs simultaneously without them being completely interoperable. Um, so there were a, a, there were a few um, programs that the World Bank did with, with Nigeria, including giving financial, technical, and policy assistance. And they also helped build, build what was called the strategic ID roadmap with the government of Nigeria, which was then reflected in their projects and in their agreements with the government as well. And this model resembled Aadhaar in, a, in many ways, and I'm just going to talk about one or two. The first was that they recommended that the Nigerian system be a foundational ID, which is that citizens have one ID that is then incorporated into a series of services. So across social protection, health, education, private services, et cetera. And that would be the kind of way forward for e-government from then on. And second, uh, I think before the World Bank's intervention here, the Nigerian system was looking at a general, general multipurpose card, a smart card, essentially. But the bank recommended that biometrics be the only identifier as a way to cut the initial costs associated with the system. This was something that the Aadhaar system was also kind of touted for because it was able to build Aadhaar with very, very limited costs. The second was that they recommended a unique ID. In fact, they didn't just recommend a unique ID. They defined ID in all of the agreements to be a unique ID. That is, a resident can only get one ID from one ID provider, and it would be with them from birth to death, or as they call it, cradle to grave system. Um, and to the extent they recommended that the national identity numbers be automatically issued with the birth registration in Nigeria and that these NINs be seeded into other beneficiary databases so that they're able to uh, complete deduplication and kind of weed out any ghost beneficiaries or fraudulent IDs. Again, the focus here was largely on minimizing leakages like the Aadhaar system. And finally, they did something, this was, this was reflected in a lot of their um, documents, which is that they uh, suggested that instead of making the ID mandatory in Nigeria, you instead follow an adoption policy that entrenches it into daily life. So they recommended some key services that the ID be instantly linked to, including um, know your customer services for bank accounts, health and social protection programs, education, and SIM card registration. Uh, this was also, this is very similar to the adoption strategy in India, where all of these things were at some point made mandatory and did kind of really incentivize the up, really in, incentivize people to get an Aadhaar because it would be really hard for you to survive in India without an Aadhaar. And that's something they recommended in this as well. In the strategic roadmap, in fact, they wanted the initial use cases to be in safety net, financial inclusion, and elections, as that would really drive the uptick of the ID. And lastly, once again, they were the bank was very clear in putting a, a lot of necessary safeguards in these agreements itself. So they did Kind of have these as disbursement um, uh, conditions that there, there would be a data protection bill that was enacted there would be certain very important uh, provisions in their laws including increasing the range of people who can receive it reducing discrimination etc which are all definitely really um, good measures on their part but uh, i think the caveat is that 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 doesn't often work i mean we've already seen in nigeria that the ID system has been made mandatory in a lot of uh, ways. There's been a lot of controversy. And we've seen a similar experience in India where currently the ID system is voluntary according to the laws for most reason, for most purposes. But uh, on ground, it's still something that's being asked for by service providers. And so it makes life very, very inconvenient for an Aadhaar less resident. And that's what we fear is already happening in these countries, regardless of the safeguards. So yeah, that's that's all from me. I mean, the report has a lot more, but uh, I could not fit that into this much time. So uh, back to you, Tom. Thank you, Shruti. That's um, re re really, really, uh, really fascinating work. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'd urge, um, I'd urge people to take a look at the link which I put in the chat there. Um, you know, I've been working on um, Kenya for some time, and I certainly learned a lot from that work. Um, finally, I want to turn to um, Privacy International's Noah Haider. Um, as always, feel free to put in um, 
questions in the in the chat, which we will um, which we will get to. Um, and uh, no, please do um, tell us about Privacy International's work in this area. Hi, Tom, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'd like to start by saying that it's a pleasure to be here um, and to be presenting with uh, co-panelists from um, the Center for Internet and Society in India and NYU, um, because mostly because I think it's quite difficult today to talk about global issues without um, kind of erasing the nuance of uh, how you know, local communities are impacted, but the, the issue of the World Bank and social protection um, is a very good example of how um, these policies have a very serious global impact. It's very difficult to measure just how many people are impacted um, by these policies. So it's great to be here and to have an international audience. Um, I'll try and jump right into it because we don't have much time. Um, so PI's research um, kind of posed the question of whether the World Bank's current approach to social protection projects um, requires a kind of privacy trade-off, particularly during times of crises. So our research took a broader look at social protection projects and so differs slightly from the focus of my co-panelists, which were on digital ID. Um, so in terms of context and why we did this research, um, the, the idea was that in response to the unprecedented socioeconomic and public health threats that were posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, social protect, we, know, we knew that social protection programs were rolled out across the world. Um, we also saw that in terms of access to social protection and the importance of robust and well-functioning systems, COVID had highlighted that there was an urgent and global need to strengthen these systems precisely so that the poorest and most vulnerable members of our communities could be protected during times of crises. Um, so our idea was that policymakers now have to reflect on how data intensive and tech reliant social safety net programs are being rolled out and funded and what the risks to um, human rights and um, fundamental dignity and, and the fundamental rights to dignity are because we are preparing for emergencies still to come. So jumping right into our research, our research methodology and aim, um, the way that we went about researching our report uh, was to focus on a specific number of social safety net projects, which were financed by the World Bank during the pandemic. We analyzed information that, was, that has been made public by the World Bank. Similarly to my co-panelists, we looked at project initiation documentation, the social and environmental impact assessments, and open source research from civil society in these countries. Some of the examples of the data which um, has been made public can be seen here on the slides. We would say that um, we do welcome the transparency that the bank specifically has in terms of the documents that, have, that are shared on their websites. Um, we also reached out to key members of the World Bank's jobs and social protection team to discuss this research, to review it. They responded. We had a meeting and, and they did also, um, uh, you know, tell us what they thought. Um, you know, th there are issues that they didn't respond to specifically in relation to data protection. Um, and that's what we go into in our report. And broadly, uh, what we want to highlight here is that our aim is to inform um, future implementation of these kinds of projects by reflecting on how certain aspects of social protection projects can inadvertently lead to excessive surveillance, particularly of marginalized communities and can have an impact on access to urgent social, social protection disbursements. Um, so the final point on methodology is just to highlight that the countries that we looked at, we looked into eight uh, so-called COVID-19 response projects, which had the explicit aim of delivering social assistance to individuals and families on a non-contributory basis. So this means the intended beneficiaries are people who had not previously paid into social insurance programs. Um, so 
you know, this, we know that this usually includes people uh, who work within informal economies, people who are unemployed, and people who, for one reason or another, don't have a registered identity in the state that they live in. Um, the reason we selected only eight projects is because um, we wanted to make sure we had enough time to jump, to, to delve right into the documents around these projects. And we will acknowledge off right off the bat that, you know, these projects don't reflect, they're not represent, representative of all social safety net projects in the industry, but they certainly help us draw conclusions which are relevant to development financing in general and emergency social safety net projects in particular. Um, so in terms of jumping right into our key findings, um, the first key finding is that it's certainly not clear whether or not the World Bank specifically systematically accounts for the risks associated with data intensive and tech reliant social safety net programs. Um, we also found that a common feature of the projects was the integration of tech-based and data-intensive solutions, ostensibly to achieve efficiency gains through things like automation, data centralization, and data sharing across government agencies. And finally, that, um, you know, well, actually going back to the, sorry, just going back one step. And finally, that it's, it's just important to highlight that a lot of the stated aims of these programs is firstly to increase coverage, but secondly, to lay the foundation for what is termed robust emergency protection systems for the most uh, vulnerable memory members of our community. So these projects were aimed at starting to build these kinds of systems. Um, so our key argument is that if this is laying the foundation for future robust systems, particularly to expand access, it's very important that these projects are designed and implemented in ways that account for and are informed by the potential risks and harms associated with integrating what we what we consider to be tech-based solutions. Um, you know, we think that these institutions, and particularly the World Bank, can get it right, um, that you can build social protection systems without having to trade um, people's right to privacy. So I'm running out of time, but very quickly, um, I will run through the, the practices and potential problems that we highlight in our report. Um, but you can see the table that I'll present here um, within our report, and we can certainly share that with anyone who would like to look at it. Um, one of the biggest trends that we identified was um, the World Bank um, encouraging and effectively funding or financing the development of very data in intensive social registry databases, which would be administered um, internally within countries by agencies such as the Ministry of Social Affairs. Um, you know, the, we list the countries where we saw this, we list the kind of um, potential problems that arise from this, and you know, this includes everything from data insecurity to data sharing with security agencies. Um, a very brief example from Lebanon is that we know that um, one of the applications, which was called Impact, which was initially financed and developed during COVID-19 to do everything from signing up for vaccines to request permission to leave during lockdown, was found by local researchers to be insecure, which means that people's highly sensitive data was put at risk just by being on this platform. Um, we also looked at um, the trend of automating eligibility determinations, which meant that um, these programs encourage the use of automation um, to uh, target um, beneficiaries uh, without necessarily putting in place uh, mitigations for this, this kind of targeting. Um, you know, again, we, we've highlighted some very well-known issues um, around putting this in place, particularly in countries where the government doesn't necessarily have um, the level of investment necessary to sustain these kinds of systems. Um, one of the, uh, another, uh, you know, some other key issues here is lack of transparency around the eligibility criteria and the determinations that are being made. Um, we saw that there was a reliance on um, big data uh, and machine learning. So, for example, looking at indices that are highly non-transparent and that impact the fairness of whether or not people are eligible. Um, 
And then finally, one thing I did want to touch on before closing off is um, digitalizing payments, um, particularly because we saw an example from independent observers in Mozambique that people um, were being threatened and harassed over the phone by individuals demanding that their phones, which are linked to benefits, were handed over to them. So we saw, you know, that there were um, there was not much protection in place for that. So I'll conclude by saying um, that our position is, is, you know, quite clear. When the World Bank and other institutions set up systems which continuously collect massive amounts of personal data without implementing parallel human rights safeguards, um, people are put at risk. That's the, that's the long and the short of it. Um, it's especially concerning in countries such as Haiti, Lebanon, Nigeria, Jordan, and Morocco, where political dissidents, human rights defenders, and journalists face repression and work under threat of violence and arbitrary, arbitrary detention. In these contexts, it's particularly important to protect people's safety and security, their sensitive and, and, their, and their sensitive and personal data. Uh, we hope to have some time for questions and to discuss recommendations. But if, until then, I will hand back to um, Tom and stop sharing my screen so that we can maybe uh, open up the discussion. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Noah. Um, I thought partly in response to Sylvia's question about some of the recommendations coming out from um, Caitlin's NYU reports, I thought it might be an idea to see if the panel had any um, specific policy recommendations emerging from their work. Um, uh, Caitlin, is there anything, any couple of main headline points you'd like to, uh, like to raise? Sure. I, I, as Sylvia rightly mentions, um, and thank you very much for that question, the last section of our report has a few kind of buckets of recommendations that we've made um, that are primarily, to be honest, addressed to the human rights community and also to civil society, to academic researchers and journalists, um, and less directed towards the World Bank um, itself. But we've grouped these kind of in, in response to uh, a quite well-known quote, I think, by Nanda Nalakani, who was one of the architects of ATAR, um, who said, you know, the way that we've accomplished this system, and I'm paraphrasing here, is to do it quickly, do it quietly, and build a coalition that wants ATAR. Um, and I think we're, in the spirit of course correction, addressing the concerns that we've raised in our report, um, advocating for a slightly different approach. And the way that we've summarized this is to say, you know, number one, not so fast. Number two, make it public. And number three, we are all stakeholders. And I'll keep this extremely brief because I want to um, have more time for discussion. But in terms of not so fast, you know, one of the key lessons here is that a lot of these systems are being accelerated, uh, particularly in light of you know, Noah's presentation on COVID-19 response. Um, and there is a real need to pause and to slow down the process of implementation, particularly given the quite egregious research gaps and that's not just about assessing the impact of digital ID systems that already exist, but you know there are a number of tools that are not being used, including baseline studies, context-based analysis, cost-benefit, value for money, human rights impact assessments. You know, there's a toolkit available that is simply not being used to have the information needed to plan systems that are going to be human rights compliant. Uh, in terms of making it public, you know, this is a, a call for greater transparency and for real participation that recognizes the intense power dynamics that exist within this space between technology companies and individuals, between national governments and local populations, and between international organizations like the World Bank um, and also the people who are working on the ground. So there are a lot of disconnects, a lot of power dynamics. And if you want to have real participation, then there needs to be much more openness, much more transparency, and much more willingness to engage in critical discussion by those who have the power to make a lot of these fora happen, which tends to be institutions like the bank, um, who have a lot of global convening power. And the final one, you know, we are all stakeholders. I think the experiences in places like India, in Kenya, um, in work that we've done in Uganda has shown that you know, the ambition of these systems is so broad, they often attempt to touch every single person within a population um, and to access some of their most personal details. And 
to influence so many different areas of life, you know, that schematic that I showed at the beginning of my presentation. So there's really need for a very broad coalition of actors who are willing to scrutinize these systems and ensure that they're on the right track. Um, I think the, the lesson of other places is it's never just civil society, it's never just digital rights organizations, it's never just economic and social rights organizations, it's often journalists, um, academic researchers who are have been the ones who have been able to kind of trigger impact and ensure that these systems are better. So we're just advocating for a much more broader coalition of stakeholders, you know, locally, nationally, regionally, and globally, um, who can be working on these systems and contribute to the discussion. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, no, do you have any policy recommendations emerging from a PI's work in this area? Yeah, definitely. I think I can try and also um, answer maybe uh, one of the questions or address one of the questions in our like as I present our policy recommendations. Um, so first of all, you know, just echoing what Caitlin said, there there are existing um, mitigations that um, that not just the World Bank, but a lot of financing institutions are not putting in place. And we have to ask ourselves why these are not being prioritized and you know what this means. So it's great to see um, people come out and people be engaged and you know try and think of ways forward um, to slow this process. Um, in terms of um, some of the concrete recommendations, uh, we can talk about due diligence processes quite a bit and the World Bank does do a lot of due diligence in terms of um, scoping the uh, current uh, landscape before they before they undertake project implementation. But um, when it comes to data protection legislation, privacy and data protection generally, there's kind of a tick box of whether or not there, the data protection legislation is there. Okay, that's great um, if a country does or doesn't have data protection legislation, but we all know what it, that there's a big difference between effective legislation and legislation on paper. Um, and we think that there's a huge onus on the uh, financing organizations to look at whether or not these are effective. So this goes back to the point about we are all stakeholders. We've not seen any evidence of engagement with civil society organizations within these countries um, to say, look, we don't think that the government should have this kind of power or these kinds of social registry databases because of the way that they treat people's data or they've historically treated people's data or because of the way that certain groups um, tend to be discriminated against, whether it's asylum seekers or undocumented persons within those countries. Um, so it's taking the due diligence processes from a superficial, um, yes, sure, there's data protection legislation, but what does that mean in practice? And, and who's saying that this legislation works? Um, additionally, we've said that the human rights impact assessments should not be um, sidelined. The World Bank, I think, um, from our understanding and from our research, doesn't undertake specific human rights impact assessments. They do uh, social and environmental ones, but in terms of human rights impact assessments, they say that they take an apolitical approach. Um, we think that this is um, not sufficient when it comes to building these kinds of systems, especially when they're so wide ranging and have such um, deep impacts on society. Um, and then finally, uh, we think that the mitigations and safeguards have been completely overlooked. Um, so one, you know, you can think of a huge amount of issues with digitalization or did, you know, digital social protection systems and um, everything from interagency unauthorized use of sensitive data, data leaks, algorithmic bias, inaccurate data on registry systems, um, lack of transparency, error, none of these things were taken into account. They were just told, collect people's data, put them on social registry base, uh, databases, and then there was no mitigation in place uh, for what happens when there's an error. And if I'm just, we can start answering the questions quite quickly, but I can give a personal anecdote, which may make people laugh. I currently live in the UK, um, and I've just been faced with a huge issue with HMRC, which is the tax um, agency in the UK, because of a major error that they made in relation to self-assessment tax that they think I owe. This has had a huge impact on me because they've used a power that they have 
to take money directly from my salary from my employer to effectively recover debt, which I don't owe. This is in a country where um, HMRC has huge powers and capabilities, has some of what they term like the highest or the best technologies. And I'm someone who has a very understanding employer who's gonna help me out. You know, if this is an error that's being made, um, you know, at the level of HMRC in the UK, we can only imagine the levels of error that would happen in, without oversight across the world um, when we're digitalizing uh, these kinds of benefit systems. So I'll stop there and then hopefully we can um, answer some of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noah. Um, I think it is worth mentioning um, Shefali Malahotra's question regarding the World Bank's response to the open letter from civil society. Um, because um, there is, I think it's important to flag, there has been ongoing dialogue and, and a relationship there between the World Bank and civil society organisations, both through the research we talked about today, but other, um, other consultations and discussions on issues like surrounding the, um, surrounding the principles. So it is worth flagging that there is some, um, some dialogue there um happening and hopefully that will continue to get really an understanding and to really address the concerns raised in that letter fully as well as the issues raised in this in this research to hopefully bring about genuine um genuine change um as well caitlin do you have anything to add on this because of your involvement in that um that letter and some of those some of those dialogues no, I think I just emphasize Tom's point that, you know, there is ongoing dialogue and I think all of the panelists here today and a lot of the people who've been involved in all of our research are very open to that dialogue and want this to become a much more constructive space where the concerns of not just organizations like CIS, CIHRGJ and PI, but, you know, the grassroots organizations, the people working with communities are given a real voice in some of the decisions that are being made at the kind of international level so i think we're quite hopeful that you know the open letter will help us to open some of this space and i think we look forward to, to continue dialogue on that and i should also flag reflecting some of the questions that there have been um you know the data protection laws introduced in many countries you know surrounding um surrounding the introductions of these kind of these kind of systems. Um, I was wondering if anyone could reflect though in you know, the World Bank's approach to data protection, even though um, it could be argued they are promoting data protection laws in some contexts. Um, you know, how would we assess their approach to an issue like data protection? Um, I can try and answer from based on our experience. Um, so in our dialogue with the World Bank, um, I think they were quite keen to hear more from Privacy International about, you know, the ways that data protection must be integrated into uh, their approach, especially with the jobs and social protection team. At the same time, um, they consider it, they, they seem to consider it to be um, a huge exercise and a kind of secondary concern. Understandably, in times of crises, and particularly during COVID, there was an urgent need to push these out. But our position remains that this has been an issue for years. This issue has been highlighted by civil society actors in the space for, for decades. And or for maybe two decades now. And to say that, oh, well, we needed to push this out urgently, so data protection wasn't a top priority, is kind of putting the, the cart before the horse, so to speak, because if data protection had been prioritized previously, it would have been a default, not something that still needs to be worked on. Um, so it's very much this position that data protection is not as urgent as um, the, the, the fact that these programs need to be rolled out regardless of, of the situation on the ground. There's also the, the position which we mentioned, which is 
the World Bank takes an apolitical stance towards its project implementation, which makes it very hard to have um, human rights impact assessments um, in relation to rolling all this out, um, which then makes it more difficult to say that data protection is a heightened concern in certain contexts. Um, and then maybe to answer the question of legal oversight of the systems in jurisdictions uh, where they'll be implemented. So a possibility for a legal for legal oversight for a rights-based approach to digital ID. This is Asher Goldstein's question. Um, I mean, certainly we've looked into what it would mean to have proper oversight of these systems um, beyond just looking at data protection. Um, that would require strengthened um legislation around surveillance, around data sharing generally, and around um, what it means for the government to hold this amount of data and to have access to this amount of data. Um, we've advocated for a whole range of different limitations on how this can be used. Um, I think at the EU level, you've seen a range of legislation around um, various issues related to just beyond data protection, you know, for example, the AI Act and how this kind of data is legally used. Um, but again, the problem remains implementation. So even where there, where there are systems, where there's a design system of oversight, um, what does that really mean in countries like Lebanon and Jordan, where you know, the countries are completely strapped for cash and it doesn't look like the judiciary is overseeing anything, let alone the social protection system, um, obviously in a, in a broad sense. Uh, thank you very much, Noah. Um, there's been a wide range of questions from the audience. Thank you very much. We are running short on time, so it's very difficult to know um, to answer. There is some large, um, very large questions being being um, being poised. For instance, the you know what alternatives there are to these kind of foundational model of um of uh digital id put forward by um by many of these uh international bodies including often the world bank um i was wondering if um if if anyone had any um any perhaps final comments about what alternative routes forward there could be for the um for the um you know international community and how we how we can begin to think and address these issues um, differently without reverting to what could be described as an ADA model that Shruti um, identified. Um, I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on roads forward. Sure, I get, I'm happy to, to start with the kind of concluding remarks um, and to address what you've just asked, Tom, knowing that we're, we're running short of time. But I think Touching a bit also on what Nora has just said about legal frameworks, I think a fundamental challenge with a more foundational approach to digital ID that will, again, touch so many areas of life and policy is that it becomes very difficult to craft a legal framework that will adequately address all of the issues. So while from a data protection privacy perspective, you might have an idea of what a framework could look like and there are existing you know, institutions and legal frameworks in place, that's not the limit of these systems, right? The limit is far beyond that. So when you talk about oversight, you're talking about oversight of the social protection system. You're talking about, as some of the questions mentioned, you know, oversight of the healthcare system, of education, of banking, of, and the list kind of goes on and on because that is the nature of the systems that are being proposed here, right? They are meant to be multi-purpose, interoperable, kind of ever-expanding systems. So designing a legal framework is is quite challenging and I don't think we have the answer you know there are obviously suggestions about stronger non-discrimination laws about addressing different aspects of the privacy components but it it's hard to be comprehensive um, when the system itself is, is so ambitious and touches so many areas of life in ways that we don't fully understand yet and interacts with so many different existing areas of policy in ways that can be you know, quite surprising and, and quite uh, different than other things that have been done in the past. So I think in terms of a, an alternative model, I think there is a need to kind of break free of the existing paradigm and the way of thinking about these systems that the only solution is a foundational model that must fulfill 
all of these different uses at once because what we've seen is that some of them are in contradiction to one another. So a system that is designed to work well for national security uh, might not be the system that you want to be used for social protection or healthcare. Um, so I, I think there's a, a kind of a need to break free of that kind of constricted way of thinking to be more creative, think about different alternatives, and also to acknowledge that it might be slightly less efficient from a cost or a traditional idea of what efficiency looks like. And that might be desirable based on other values of human rights and other kind of principle-based values um, that efficiency cannot be our only goal. You know, it might be cheaper to have a central system, but it might be harmful to have a central system. So it's important to balance those you know, goals and the different uh, policy areas that we're trying to achieve and ensure that we, we have the calibration right and that we're not just trying to shoehorn uh, one system in an area that may require many. Yeah, I just want to quickly um, add to that with a small um, kind of anecdote, which is that during the Aadhaar case in the Supreme Court, um, when it was contested that, you know, a lot of, ex there were a lot of exclusions and a lot of people uh, suffering because of the Aadhaar system, um, the government kind of said that this, this system is a work in progress and uh, that there were a few errors made, but, you know, we'll, we'll correct our ways. And I think uh, the fact that we are first applying digital ID systems, which are pretty com complex systems and not easy to get on the first go, two systems of social protection, people that, uh, two systems that are meant to help people that are already disadvantaged and vulnerable, is I think a, a kind of strategy we need to deviate from. We like this isn't this shouldn't be the first use case of digital ID because we haven't yet got it right. And I think yeah, I can't really answer what alternative models would be, but just to say that this shouldn't be the first use case of digital ID because it is arguably the most important, it's literally saving human life. And I think that was that is a, largely the point that we are also trying to get across that it need not be the way for social protection. It just currently is being recommended as a way forward. No, do you have a final word? Literally one. <laughs> um, I think, well, the final point on just the way forward and maybe also addressing the questions on alternatives to ID systems is to emphasize the point that the work we're doing isn't to say that um, we have to halt all technological progress or reliance on technology um, as a way forward. Uh, it's to highlight, first of all, that the approach has been that this approach has been taken without adequate considerations, without adequate mitigation, and with like very clear, wide-ranging impact on people's lives. Um, with a question mark around, as Shruti said, why this is being posed as the only solution. Um, we open our research by saying we recognize the need for urgent social protection systems to be put in place, especially as crises become compounded around the world. But the, the amount of, in, we have to highlight that the amount of investment that goes into and the amount of debt that is being built up just to build these systems, which have these huge, threats that we keep talking about um, is effectively um, not working properly, right? So why is it constantly being pushed as the only solution? We're not saying that um, there's this other perfect model that exists, but why is so much money and resource being poured into it when it's clearly not the best way um, to ensure that people have access? Uh, that's kind of the way forward to continue to push these questions um, to slow it down. Um, and to highlight issues like um, error and anecdotes and the problems that have been highlighted around the world by multiple organizations. But yeah, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, it's been a great panel and a great opportunity to talk about our research. Um, and I would echo that in conclusion. And I just think that all that remains is to thank our three panelists, Caitlin, Shruti and Noor, and um, thank you to all our attendees and uh, people who have asked questions. Um, obviously, there's a lot to cover here, and we could um, hopefully continue this dialogue in future discussions um, between ourselves and also, you know, with 
um, organizations such as the World Bank itself. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.